and we are very happy today to have uh, Anna from the World Wide Web Foundation who is joining us to talk about the uh, gender and open data uh, intersection with us. And it's a very important topic and we are really looking forward to hear from Anna on, on, on this area. So thank you, Anna, for joining us and we look forward to hear from you. Thank you for having me. Okay. So uh, hello, everybody. I can't see you, which is unfortunate, uh, but I'm hoping that we can have a, a great discussion after uh, my presentation. So my name is Anna Bundeshescu, and I work on research and policy at the World Wide Web Foundation. And today I'll be talking to you about the gender and open data intersection. So first, let's just kick off things with um, both gender and open data. So gender is really about us looking at socially constructed differences um, in the attributes and opportunities um, that associate with being a specific gender and to the social interactions and relationships between all genders. So it can also uh, take on a cultural aspect. Um, and what is open data? Um, in case we have uh, new callers who are new to the topic, um, open data is data that can be freely used, modified, shared by anyone for any purpose. It is data that is technically and legally open. So why have open data? Well, first, it's really because it should be data that's for everyone, a right for all. Um, it's about having the data that people need and data that people can easily use. So first, I will start with our research and projects. So one of the projects I work on is the Open Data Barometer, uh, which looks at the state of uh, open government data from around the world. So currently, uh, we've assessed um, over, over 116 countries all around the world in terms of readiness, impact, and uh, use um, of this data and implementation. And here we found that most government data is still not open. Um, and that the data that is available isn't really the data that people need or it's there to improve their lives. And last but not least, the government data um, that is there, it's really hard to use. So here, just to set things off in a more challenging way to say, we do have a long way to go. As you can see, uh, some of the, con the countries that publish open data on five specific and crucial areas are often lacking, which are budgets, company registries, spending, contracting, and land ownership. And these all can relate to gender and the use of them by uh, different actors, um, and especially women. Um, so to move things along, um, one of our very important projects that we've had is an initiative called Tech Muso in Cote d'Ivoire that uh, my colleague Nana Wakama led uh, a couple of years back in 2016. Um, and Tech Muso stands for, is defined as Tech Woman, um, and it focused on five major themes, economic activity, health, legal and political capacity, human capital, and education. So to start this off, it, it's, it was a different project than the usual challenges and um, competitions and initiatives out there. Um, the, project had an open call that included uh, tapping in the network of seven ministries, 150 NGOs, 50 media houses, thousands and hundreds of thousands uh, of people on blogs, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, videos, you name it, on the web. Um, they gathered 80 teams that presented bids. Um, 40 of those teams pitched their projects, and 20 of the teams got to work uh, on them. And this is different than what usually happens in the hackathon setting because they did have uh, largely way more time to develop their ideas and um, present an outcome and a solution to these uh, key themes and the challenges that they encounter. So one of the um, competition winners is the Mafu Vote team, which I will tell you more about. Uh, so this is uh, them uh, at the very end when they've uh, the award ceremony and they uh, received the prize. So out of those 20 teams, 10 were winners. So I will go through um, these with you just to um, give you an example of 
what kind of uh, so technical solutions they've provided and created for um, this initiative. So Scoop Progab um, ended up helping women cooperatives. Um, so they are Shia Butter Collective uh, to access market prices. And this is very much in, uh, in line with Godan's work. So I thought it was a good uh, example of linking open data to sectoral use. Um, Kalanda was an SMS-based data-driven uh, initiative that focused on free health and services. Devlogies uh, looked again at SMSs and as having services application for schools, so education. Um, uh, to link to that is Super Aya on the same note, um, where they've built an education data platform for academic orientation. And Nova Police Blaye. Um, provided real-time data facilitation between care, patients and caregivers. So following those five, the last five were the Stat Muso, which built a dynamic platform to collect data on causes of women's death, and SDI's Le Grand Marché, uh, which was a web app connecting women working in the food supply sector with external markets. Uh, Laptix looked at mapping gender-based violence for evidence-based decision-making, which I will be talking to you more about the importance of addressing online and offline harassment later. Uh, so keep that in mind. MCM um, provided a health pass, uh, which looked at gender data that was readable through QR codes. And Mafubo, which was pictured earlier, um, connected the data across health institutions to reduce maternal deaths. So this is a photo of um, the project, the, the first project that I mentioned in my work. And uh, it's the focus on the Shea butter um, women who produce uh, this uh, crop and this uh, product for the free market um, to share. So what they did was basically create this app to make sure that their um, products and produce would be fairly um, you know, sold and uh, used on the market level. Uh, so Scoop Program uh, aimed to really reduce poverty for the members by helping them access markets for that produce. Uh, and this is in the northern town of Buma in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, so this kind of shows that creating access to new economic opportunities and uh, dismantling barriers to market entry is really crucial for uh, everybody, but for women in particular. So helping uh, women to learn the market price of their produce, the actual price, uh, to achieve fair prices for what they sell is really crucial. So what were the lessons learned for TechMuso, which I think would apply for many other um, projects as well. Well, first, um, it's really important that we generate more gender data in, in general, um, which is nothing new. We know that already, but we must keep continuing the work. Second, opening up existing data is really, really vital. And I think that's why we're all here. That's uh, what we think open data is about and should be about and achieve. So um, we have to look at the data that is free and available for anyone to access and use. And that really is the underlying factor, is the anyone. Um, it's about confirming open data to global standards. So once it's open, how can it uh, match the standards of, let's say, the open data charter and the, the principles that they have? Um, and taking it uh, to that conversation from local to national to global and back to local again. Uh, it's about building the technology capacity of national actors involved, uh, encouraging continuing dialogue among data actors and the gender community. Um, as we all know, we are all in a bit of a silo. So even with agriculture and open data, bringing those two communities together takes effort. It also takes an effort to bring in the gender community with the data actors and the governments and the private sector. So um, creating more networks uh, between those existing networks um, is really crucial. It's also important to incentivize and promote data champions. Uh, so this is 
this ranges from having these types of initiatives, bringing people together, showcasing their work, helping them follow up and continue to make sure that these platforms last, that they're sustainable, that they get feedback and demand, because they do uh, actually are solutions to problems that they face. So how do we make sure that uh, these projects can keep going and are sustainable? Um, it's also about empowering institutions' data capacity, because we know what the problems are, um, but we have to have the capacity around to make sure that uh, these uh, institutions can take on these work and address these challenges, because without that capacity, we cannot do anything from the data angle. It's also about including the voices of rural women and vulnerable groups. So uh, we want to avoid the fact that open data can perhaps empower the empowered. Uh, so this is back to Michael Gerstein's uh, article back in 2011 when, when he uh, makes this note. But it's really important that open data is for everyone, includes everyone, and the voices of everyone, especially uh, these groups. We often talk about the urban setting, so bringing the rural uh, setting in and centering it is key. And I think um, agricultural and grow dan dance in a good place to, to do that together. It's also about mapping and visualizations uh, for data communications. So uh, it's important to showcase data and, and analysis in uh, a number of ways and not just uh, text or charts. So be interactive, um, show online methods, show offline methods. They're both important. Not everybody's online. In fact, 50% of the world isn't. So it's important to be able to use data and cutting edge work in traditional formats and communication means. And last but definitely not least, it's about leaving no one behind. So as my very wise colleague said, Nana, Tech Musso showed that gender data and open data do not have to be reserved for geeks or politicians. Everyone everywhere can use and benefit from data. So I'd really like to take this message forward to, to, to bring it in and, and make sure that uh, we do make data available for everyone, uh, that everyone can benefit from and use. So another project that um, I have uh, ongoing right now with Nana and also with several other um, partners uh, is the House Open Data Working for Women in Africa. So it's a gender and open data project specifically for Africa. And we aim to answer this really uh, important but difficult question. And I will I'll definitely share with you the, the work when that comes out uh, in the next couple of months. So we've been working with Budget IT from Nigeria, uh, with the Women of Uganda Network, uh, with Open Data Durban from South Africa, um, and Afro Leadership from Cameroon, to first get a context of how is gender working or not, or reflective of open data, open government, access to information, and right to information legislation uh, in those countries and then how can we then take that to the continent and address it as broader uh, findings or rather as we found them challenges uh, that can then we can uh, um, share recommendations for that different uh, stakeholders can take forward. So we've been looking at government, civil society, media and also regional bodies to see how they can all be involved um, in making a difference in in um, using op in having women use open data to really benefit themselves um, in Africa. So again, I will share with you that work once it's out. Another project that the Web Foundation has been working on is through our open data labs in Jakarta. So this is a, a project on open gender data in Jakarta in Indonesia. Uh, it focuses on looking at the women's development budget for the at the subnational level and seeing how it's been used uh, and, and applied. So 
the lab has been working with IDEA, uh, which is an NGO in Jogja. And they produced really great visualizations such as this one that they can print out. So uh, here, as you can see, all of it is in Bahasa. Uh, it's uh, Indonesian. Um, so that's another point to make. It's really important to have these uh these outcomes be in local languages as much as possible uh to um to e reach more people and to be also just more interesting and not necessarily just numbers and grids and i mean budgets are typically themselves not completely uh interesting so it's nice to have these comics um uh, here and there to have conversations and to understand what they are saying um, so i think they did a really great job in this um, because every resident um, of the villages that these this budget is uh, applied in should know so this is part of uh, the wanalilo village um, in in jogja uh, so back to the online and offline conversation so this is why communications mediums matter so you have they ended up producing these really great newspapers uh, that they can distribute in the community in case somebody doesn't have um, access to um, the web or they just don't have the data provided. They can also take this in and read it carefully and ask questions and and uh, come back to the forums that they are a part of to um, to make things more clear and understand what they can do with it. So from that point on, uh, we can't forget that open data is really also about access to information. So it's about it being a fundamental human right. It's about the basis of uh, having state citizens interactions. Um, it is really fundamental in governance and also in participation. And it's a measure of democracy. Uh, and that's why, again, like I, I do really consider it a building block for open data. So again, less of the silos and making sure that uh, we have uh, open data and access to information work connected as well. Um, it's really key. So this is where our women's rights online work comes in, which is um, also the Web Foundation. And it's a network of women um, across Latin America, Africa, Southeast Asia, and MENA region um, who work on different access and use um, projects and in digital rights groups and gender rights groups. Um, and so the work that we do together, this is who the network is. Um, so we do really span uh, a lot, much of the global south, is to make sure that we get more women online to understand how they are using, that, that they're not just accessing data, but using data and that they're doing it in in a way that makes their interaction with governments uh, better and more fruitful and that their voices are heard and also that they um, help uh, put together and provide online safer online spaces through trainings and materials so our research um, started in 2015 and uh, looks at translating access into empowerment and then it was linked to women's rights online and the digital gender gap audit. So my colleagues in Angira Sambuli and Ingrid Brudvig led this work um, where you know we really wanted to know and find out how women in urban poor communities are accessing and using the web. Um, but from that we had to really know like how can we link the research to policy. So in 2016 we wrote these recommendations for how governments should react to the digital gender gap. So to give you a short uh, outline and snapshot of how, uh, you know, how are women online? Well, women are 50% less likely to access the internet than men and 30 to 50% like, less likely to use it for personal empowerment. So finding a job or having a political voice. Um, and this study was done in over 10 cities um, in urban settings um, across the global south. So the, they, we found that the major barriers to use and to access and use are know-how, cost, relevance, um, device, um, time, and um, 
infrastructure. Uh, so as you can see that know-how is definitely the largest out of these in cost. So it's important that training efforts are made, that capacity building efforts are made, um, and that we reduce the cost. And we also in incentivize uh, women to come online because the relevance is really important. Is there the right content available? Um, is it not? How can we make that content uh, more catered to what they need? So we created REACT, a policy framework to assess on how we can close the digital gender gap uh, in terms of access and use. So here we look at rights, education, access, content, and targets. So for rights, it's about protecting online and, and rights and also uh, privacy uh, in law. Uh, it's about equipping the police and judiciary with training and resources to fight online violence. Uh, education is about integrating basic digital literacy in school curricula at all levels. So this is really important that it happens at both uh, tertiary, but also at secondary and primary school levels and expand digital literacy training beyond just technical skills. So really be critical with the data that you're looking at. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, how does it affect you? For access, achieving the Alliance for Affordable Internet's 142 affordability target is key. So the 142 affordability target, it's really about having um, one gigabyte of data for no more than 2% of an average monthly income. So again, one gigabyte of data for no more than 2% of an average monthly income, which is a, it, it is an ambitious goal in itself, but it's really important to have the cost down uh, so that everyone can access the web. It's about developing more public access solutions and also creating options for subsidized basic data allowance uh, that do really focus on women. Uh, for content, as I've said before, uh, it has to be relevant. So how do we do this? Well, it's about prioritizing local language data, information and services. Um, it's about auditing government websites to assess their gender relevance. And last but not least, it's Taking it back to policy, how so? How do we create targets adopt that adopt concrete ICT gender equity uh, measures backed by adequate budgets? So, <clears throat> we, excuse me, we might want to have these uh, these ideas roll down and this, these initiatives met, but we need to make sure that they're backed by money so that they are sustainable. It's about collecting ICT data that's disaggregated by gender, income, and location. Uh, to really understand uh, the differences between urban and rural areas um, and, and provide better, more in-depth analysis. And it's about developing new indicators to measure impact of ICT on women. So looking at targets, I also th think about and connect it to the, the sustainable development goals, which are really also relevant for open data and for gender. So if you look at SDG 1, 5, and 9, they are all related to the work on women's rights online and, and gender per se. Um, and this, is, again, isn't just about these SDGs. It's also about the data that we look at in open data barometer. <clears throat> so these are all of the, um, fifth, the sectors that we, we draw upon from. And as you can see, it's it's very much across the board. And just because it's not about gender per se, excuse me, my, I'm losing my voice. Just because it's not about <coughs> gender per se, it's really important to know how all of these affect women and men and uh, non-binary people. So it's it's taking a step back and thinking, okay, Gender disaggregated data, sex disaggregated data is important, but then how can we have uh, women use contracting data to empower themselves? Um, what kind of laws are in place that can get them to um, have more chances to bid for contracts and have those opportunities in place? 
And it's back to, to open data and more technical part, the measurement, uh, which I also do. And this is really about seeing how um, open data changes and progresses over time. So in this, we have to really look at measurement practitioners, myself included, and you know, have us listen and include people from different geographies, having that gender balance there, you know, having stakeholder groups that use or could potentially use this open data in their work and identifying them and uh, what they want change and what they think is good and uh, really take that feedback into the way uh, open data assessments are done in the future. So in terms of initiatives in the open data and journal space, you can see that there are quite a few that have built up over the years. We have the Africa Gender Index, uh, data on femicide in Brazil. We have data to X that we've collaborated on with the Tech Muso project I've showed you earlier. Uh, we also have data gender and security in Latin America. Equal Measures 2030, that's more a global-led initiative, and same as Equals. It's also a partnership across very multiple uh, stakeholders and organizations, um, the Web Foundation included. GeoChicas, which is an open street map initiative of women, um, no ceilings, also from the Gates Foundation, and the OD4D network um, that I'm sure you're all aware of as well in our space. Um, the Ready to Measure and the Wiki Loves Women, and here, I, which I don't have, but I'll talk to you about later, it's also we have Open Heroin. So as this work has started, um, we can kind of see that at events, people started having this conversations back in 2015 at the International Open Data Conference at IODC, um, and also in, in Ottawa, and also at uh, Open Government Partnership Summit in Mexico City. Then it kind of led to uh, seeing TechMoose unfold, and, and that being one uh, very much um, inaugural and um, initiative that that kicked off this work in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, specifically targeted to gender and open data. Um, and then again at IODC, uh, we had a, a session on gender that was the first um, of its kind at that conference. And at the OGP Summit, um, we've held a, a session on a gender equality and access to information with women's, our women's rights online work and, and also looking at the national action plans and their commitments around gender. Uh, and also held the first open heroines uh, uh, gender monologue. In 2017, um, the, at the UN World Data Forum, there was many discussions around uh, gender disaggregated data and work that were held and that will continue this year uh, later on. And the Open Data Brussels event also um, featured gender responsive uh, sessions as well. Um, this year at For Open Data Day, uh, Artigo19 um, held a workshop on um, data about femicides in Latin America. And also um, the upcoming OGP will host most likely um, different um, uh, sort of streams around gender, but also focusing on the feminist open government initiative FOGO that I will also mention later. And of last but not least, IODC, which again will have a big um, open heroines uh, side event, as well as gender integrated in the different uh, streams of the conference. So this is Open Heroines. Um, this is a network I'm a part of, and it's a 330 women and growing network. Uh, we have a Slack channel, we're global, um, also Medium and Twitter. So please do, if you're a woman on this call, do join us. Um, you can subscribe to our monthly newsletter. And uh, yeah, we're at, at this point, it's an independent group. And uh, we have different discussions around many things in the Slack uh, channel. It is closed um, at the moment. So uh, I'd be happy to talk to you more about that. But you kind of can see here we are at different places around the world uh, where we convene. We also have smaller meetups in different cities um, that happen at the same time as well. 
So another research in progress um, that is happening right now at the Web Foundation is with the State of Open Data chapter on gender equity, which is co-written uh, with Nana Wakama, my colleague. What we're working on here is, is just identifying this kind of, you know, where does gender equity play? Uh, what's its role in open data? And taking it from there. Um, so we have five um, recommendations that we'd like to take forward and I will share with you today. The first one is building needed evidence. So again, this is not new. Governments and organizations must invest in better data collection efforts. So this is really key and this includes gender disaggregated data, but it also includes having, making sure the data that people want is collected and it's published openly. It's about having better data access for everyone. That's really, really important that um, it, it cannot just be that they are published, but somehow there, there have to be efforts made where capacity building exists, where access to uh, the web is affordable. All of those things are uh, important for to have wider reach and inclusion. It's, we also need to invest in inst institutional change. So this is about having a broader culture shift in organizational behavior. This is not necessarily just about the open data space or the agriculture space and nutrition space. It's about looking up across all of these sectors and seeing how we can do an internal gender audit, for example, at the organization level. And that could be about you know, having them to be about open data programs and seeing how they function. And then we could have that be replicated in the entirety of those organizations or government. Again, it's about building partnership. Uh, so Godan is very good at doing this. It has a massive network. So we need to just strengthen those active gender networks, uh, including gender responsive policies in existing data partnerships. Um, and also having um, new initiatives like FOGO um, linked to organizations and initiative, initiatives and partnerships that already exist, that already do work in this space. And taking those uh, conversation to broader agendas around inclusion, public participation and accountability for governments, as well as organizations and the private sector. It's also about supporting advocacy spaces for gender specifically in the open data space, uh, which we are seeing starting to develop, but it's not quite, uh, we still have work ahead of us to do, and we have to maintain and nurture those spaces. So it's about having proactive measures to mainstream gender and open in the open ecosystem and having a no man else policies in open data meetings. So this is not necessarily just a panel a type of session at a conference or an event, but it's having uh, represent equal representation uh, in a meeting internally in an organization as well. It's about having more gender sessions at international conferences and data spaces as well, um, or have gender included in those sessions. So OGP, IODC, um, WDF, AO, Africa Open Data Conference, Condados, the ones I mentioned earlier, this, they should also be um, thinking about that space to, to build and raise awareness. Uh, and in the process of doing all of this, um, we're also creating safe spaces to counter online and offline harassment because we start to uh, mainstream gender and we start to bring it into a, a larger and more open discussion. So um, creating these spaces and countering harassment will, will be easier to be uh, done than before. Uh, so I'll just focus a bit on the No Manals Pledge. Uh, just because it's an easy thing for men to do, it's just basically an independent pledge that says, I, you know, I won't be a part of uh, male-only panels. Uh, that's the website, and it has a great set of FAQs if you're interested to read more. But we really do think that um, anybody who's presenting of a higher level, a CEO, an ED, 
um, and anybody else in senior positions and junior, um, they should be able to say no to just having these um, these conversations uh, be only for men um, and include men. So uh, if you haven't signed up to this, uh, please do. And I also recommend including no manals uh, in organizational policies as well. So I'll leave you with this. So the gender and open data intersection is about data equity, data that is for everyone, especially women, that can access and use. But how do we get there? Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, it is really imp important uh, presentation you gave, and you gave a lot of examples from a lot of women, uh, active women empowerment activities you are doing around the world, from Africa uh, to Indonesia. And this is really uh, helpful for all of us to know about your work. And thanks again for presenting this. So I will request all uh, participants to please use the opportunity. There's a chat window, so you can ask your questions uh, to Anna and she'll be very happy to answer your questions. So if you have any queries, please uh, please uh, put the questions in the chat window and we will answer one by one. Uh, uh, we'll wait for the questions and once I get that, I will ask you, Anna. So uh, while we are waiting, can I ask you a question first? Uh, so I, it is good to uh, see uh, your examples of uh, not just using technology but using like newspaper articles uh, because a lot of people from the developing countries you know uh, are, are do not have access to technology as well so it's very important the technology is also inclusive so i'm just uh, uh, thinking aloud it's like you know do, uh, did you think about uh, mediums like uh, radio for example for example in developing countries a uh, lot of uh, people uh, especially in rural areas they don't have access to, uh, to internet or other technologies so but radio is a very important tool that many poor people in rural areas and uh, remote areas have access to so have you thought about uh, uh, you know for example using uh, you know uh, using radio as a means of reaching out that's an excellent question. So radio is definitely key in all of this, and it's traditional. It's been around forever, and it's still largely used, as you've said. Uh, directly, we haven't done this anything as Web Foundation per se. I think our, some of our partners might have, so I can come back to you on that to see if yeah. how specifically they would use um, radio. Um, as some we we partner with. A, women's groups that also work on media. So I'm sure that they have in their context. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. with the Web Foundation in terms of, you know, having a mini podcast of the React framework or open data yeah. and making that as available on radio, I don't think we have, but that's an excellent idea. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think that's really, uh, you know, it is really good to see a lot of your work on a lot of women, uh, women education, capacity development activities. So uh, from your experience uh, working in, for example, in developing countries, uh, in the because I saw the slide on schools, uh, you know, how we are trying to reach out to ICT in schools levels. What do you think are the challenges, you know, for, from a technology perspective, from cost perspective, because for example, in India, I'm aware a lot of schools in develop, in especially in rural areas, you know, still, uh, you know, it's very, they don't have, uh, it's still a big challenge to have uh, internet. Uh, it's happening, but it's, it's it's not at the, you know, so it takes a lot of time to for, for technology to reach. So it has to be low cost kind of uh, technologies, but, you know, so from your exp experience, how do you, what do you think are the main challenges for education in, in developing rural areas? So for ICT uh, implementation in, in education and schools, I think that's where um, the government has to step in at mm -hmm. a local level or national level as well to help with those subsidies to make those, the hardware and software uh, low cost enough uh, because it can't just be on the people to, yeah. to do that. So this is why the um, React, the T is important, the targets. So how can we have governments commit to certain um, propositions that they could say like by 2019 we will have X amount of schools with these programs or so on. So makes you know very clear and specific commitments uh, that you know we can as a global community come back to, but also the local NGO space 
can also come to to say like, hey, have you done this or not? Um, it's really important to have those things written out and uh, you know checked upon mm -hmm. to see if uh, they they have done so or not. So mm -hmm. it's it's definitely not a just the civil society effort yeah. to, to make because this work. Um, more, governments, but also yeah. private sector, private perhaps sector, as well, so, together, which, yeah. which already yeah. does, right? Yeah. I would say to a certain extent. Yeah, it's it's a it's a, it's a it's kind of a global effort. Really, there's a lot of uh, holistic kind of activities to happen. Yeah, thank you very much, Anna. So there are some questions coming in. So I will read out to you. Uh, the first question is from Akau Henaku, who is asking. In areas where women have issues with accessing mainstream education, how can we overcome the difficulties and educate them in accessing data? Okay, so in please repeat that one more time just to get it right. Yeah, so uh, the question uh, Akao is asking is, uh, in areas where women have yeah. issues with accessing the mainstream education, how can we overcome the difficulties and educate them in accessing data? Okay, so this all comes back to Sushi's your point about data capacity building efforts. So I've discussed the part of the government that they play in terms of education, but it's also about um, building groups and networks of capac capacity building where women can be taught to use data and not intimidated by it and and used in a way that it makes sense for them so making sure that data is provided having trainers with data that incentive incentivizes them to actually use it and learn about it and it's relevant for them right so the content is everything in that so if there are local um, groups and forums that um, are that are women's spaces, but then you can bring in a technical aspect to the gender space. That is really key as a one way of overcoming this, you know, difficulty of accessing mainstream education as a whole. Like, how do we even get to the data side? But it's also about bringing in uh, journalists to report stories in different ways and bringing in the data that's available from governments and and doing analysis and writing reports and stories. Uh, because stories are really impactful and, and, and powerful. So if we can uh, talk about data as a story and bringing that into the importance of it in education um, and bringing certain uh, topics that really matter, like um, health, reproductive rights, uh, and education, in education itself, I think those are key. So finding um, the things that are most on demand, the topics that are on demand and bringing those in with local trainers that could maybe link, be linked to uh, trainers from the outside, but making sure that that dialogue kind of stays representative of what the group of women need and wants and centering them rather than us coming from the outside and coming in and, and providing a solution that is our own, but it's not the, the context. So making sure that the geog geographic context is uh, relevant and, and centered. Uh, thank you, Anna. There's another question uh, from Alexandra Chandran, who is asking, in your experience, how responsive have governments been in engaging with gender equ equality and uh, empowering women? What are the greatest barriers faced? Okay, just reading it out. So he's asking. So, you know, uh, in my experience, they have been pretty responsive. Uh, now it seems that gender is definitely the new hot topic. Um, so. As I've mentioned, uh, FOGA was uh, was created. It has it's being launched in the process uh, now. So it's a feminist open government initiative. So you could see that there are um, definitely from those of you who don't know the Open Government Partnership. It's a consortium of 75 member countries, um, and they are taking on this you know, feminist open government with the Canadian government leading the way. 
and uh, trying to to make uh, national action action plans commitments more gender responsive in general. So they they are starting to be responsive and and have um, have gender more mainstreamed in their work. So I'm I'm still waiting for those to those plans to roll out and understand the process and the methodology around it. Uh, the greatest barriers would probably be that um, it becomes, gender becomes a, a siloed factor. Like you have the gender expert in the uh, women's department that de deals with women's development or in communications, perhaps ICT, but probably not. That's where open data is or the office of the president. That's usually where open data is mostly pitched. So how do we make sure that gender doesn't become its stand standalone thing and it's more incorporated in the other uh, parts of agencies and departments of governments that's one so that's a a challenge i wouldn't say like a, it's a great barrier because this also includes having a better communication uh, in, uh, internally across governments uh, and their own bodies so it's it's addressing a, a bigger challenge and two making sure that um these efforts are uh, really hold governments accountable to what they will do to to provide better to provide you know towards gender equity. So what what are they what are these commitments doing for gender as a whole? Uh, so I think that's really an important thing to to kind of keep an eye out. Thank you, Anna. Uh, the next question is from Sonigitu Ikpi, who is asking, how can we bridge the gender gap with open data infrastructures that do not exist in many Africa, African countries? Yeah, a difficult question, but um, yeah, I mean, I'm smiling because it's, it's, really, it's a really hard one and a really important one. Um, I think it goes back to not looking at open data infrastructure and looking at access to information mm -hmm. and coming going back to the basics a little bit uh, before we're too focused on you know the data formats and machine readability and all of that we need to also have people connected and be online to use this open data if it exists as we know as i've showed you at the beginning uh, there's 70 percent of the world has open data open government data from what we've studied i mean uh, we're a long way to go, so how can we bridge those expectations? So um, back to open data infrastructures in Africa and gender. It's important to link to civil society working in these spaces, to digital rights groups, to right to information, women, uh, like gender women's rights groups, um, and make sure that they start having conversations and understand what the open data community is doing and then looking at different sectors and so what is the agriculture sector working on and creating different working groups within those uh, to make sure that information and knowledge gets shared that there's a lot of on the ground face-to-face -face meetings and follow-ups uh, because again the being online is problematic being uh, far away uh, and remote isn't really always the, the best case scenario for these things um, and making sure that there's like an open line with government uh, it, it, it has to be I know that sometimes that's difficult uh, but I think it's really important to make sure that um, find ways that civil society is heard and that might happen through um, pressures from global community if that's the case in, the, in a positive way but we do have a long way to go in, in, in terms of answering that question. Thank you, Anna. Uh, the next question is from David, uh, who is asking, what are the gender-related data that should be collected for economic development? So that's data on health and education, for mm -hmm. and foremost. Also crime data, mm -hmm. uh, national statistics data. So those are four that we've looked upon in uh, in the open data barometer specifically, especially 
and I will focus on the crime data one because it's, I think it's more rare to talk about it straight on. Uh, but to understand domestic violence and also online harassment and offline harassment and doing cases around pro providing a safer space um, online is important. We're talking about open data here, but it's also about women accessing uh, this data. So if they don't find that the space, the web is the space where they can go to and it's a positive experience, they're not going to go back to it. Given all the other um, challenges that they have and the barriers that they face to uh, experience the web and and that's and that's definitely something that um, should also be collected more to understand and to to first of all focus on having a safe space for women is number one um, mm -hmm. in online offline because we often see that um, online offline violence gets replicated on online. So how do we deal with that? Well, having better crime data, disaggregated data on that as well is one step forward to, towards that. Um, looking at health data, uh, looking at education. So education is key, knowledge is power. We have to make sure that women can attend schools, do attend schools, um, are learning about uh, everything that they need, plus open data and, and data work as well. So, and, and that the content that they have is relevant. and in terms of um, health, we know that it's, it's vital to life and we need to have the data on um, reproductive health and their rights, uh, which often is cannot be found online from government websites. So that's another sort of barrier in terms of um, you know, what is available from government websites for women specifically. So that could be an improvement for sure. Okay, we'll take one more question, Anna. Uh, so one more question, uh, let me see. Uh, this is from Paul Kasoma, who is asking, what are your plans as regards reaching the vulnerable women in low resource settings to access the data they need for their empowerment? Okay, so um, the plans to do that, I think uh, it's ours, the Web Foundation is policy and advocacy efforts for this. So we have a 50-50 campaign coming up, which is trying to find ways, build awareness around bringing the, the rest of the 50% um, who are not online to be online. Um, so that the majority of that percentage uh, are women. And that's a, an important step forward. So awareness around that, um, finding ways to engage with governments and getting them to commit to targets such as the one for two that I mentioned early. So, you know, having affordable, uh, low cost uh, data. So having one, one gigabyte of data for less than 2% of your monthly average income, it's a high ask, but if we can get governments to commit with them and work with like telecoms and, and private sector to get that going, um, that would be, those are huge, uh, milestones to be reached. Um, and also just our Women's Rights Online Network uh, works with the, the women who are not online and who are, on, off, who are online as well. So uh, any kind of work that's done locally is really key to, um, to the, the Web Foundation as well in terms of inclusion and digital inclusion. And, and bringing more uh, women in the conversation, participation in you know, having them empower themselves because they will have a voice and they will use it and don't feel afraid to do that because they are in a safe space to use it. So um, building awareness and capacity and uh, trainings and having these conversations with multi-stakeholder groups is a one way to, to do this. But it's an ongoing uh, quest as, uh, I was talking to Sue Chief earlier. It's these are long-term changes. Um, it's about social impact, and it takes uh, decades uh, to really, you know, come to fruition. But we do want to take practical, clear steps in the meantime, and and these these are parts of it. So I will share with you this these slides. So hopefully um, that can provide some context for you, and you you can always uh, reach reach out to me to ask me any questions. 
Thank you, and uh, it was a really important presentation uh, from the Glo from the Gordon's uh, Capacity Development Working Group. I want to thank you very much for this, for showing us uh, all these uh, important ideas. And uh, as I was discussing with Anna, you know, the capacity building and education is all long term. You know, and uh, women's empowerment is uh, not just women's empowerment; it's families' empowerment. It is. Uh, countries empowerment and global empowerment and I was telling my own story you know my uh, uh, my grandmother I am sitting here today thanks to the sacrifices my grandmother and my mother made for education you know so we had to always think of this long term you know if my grandmother hadn't uh, suffered and made sacrifices you know my mother will never have the opportunity to go to school so and that uh, one uh, one change you know it affected my whole family you know it, it, i am so thankful that you know so education is something which you know we have to think about and we have to focus on very much to make sure we we have that uh, uh, done for the future generation and i believe that you know having this discussion with the capacity development community is very important so we get that inputs from everyone so i want to thank anna again for her excellent presentation and we are really hoping all of you will contribute to your ideas for uh, for the capacity development activities for the future as well. So